Romans chapter 14, and if you would have your phones off at least for a little bit, that would be a help. And uh, let's stand for a moment and we'll look at the scripture. And again, thank you for coming. It's hot. Thank you for getting out tonight and weathering the weather. Some of you that are older, I know the heat's hard on you. It's hard to get out sometimes, harder yet when it's 175 degrees or whatever. Somebody said that it was, it was 118 over in Arizona in Phoenix or something like that. So it's cool here. No, it's not. It's hot. I don't care what you say. It's hot. Uh, Romans 14, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputation. For one believeth that he may eat all things, and another who is weak eateth herbs. That means if you eat vegetables, you're weak. <laughs> Strong people, steak. Barbecued ribs, come on man, shrimp, deep fried, battered shrimp. You ever have the coconut crusted shrimp there at Red Lobster? <laughs> that is from God. I'm so glad I'm not an Old Testament Jew. <laughs> man. I don't eat catfish, but I'll eat shrimp. But anyway, uh, verse 3. Uh, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. And let's pray. Father, teach us tonight, and, and I just pray to help these thoughts make our homes more peaceful, our schools better. A lot of young people here heading back to college soon. And we would ask, Lord, that they might uh, carefully understand their job and that we might make this world a better place just in the simple matters of getting along. Teach us tonight to just be gentlemen and ladies, to be Christians. And we ask for help, please, in, in interpreting and applying this. In Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. Now, in the, the context of the scriptures, let me just say, and... Um, you that are in the foyer, I don't know if those windows open or closed help. I would think the doors, the windows open get more air, but closed may double blind you of my glory up here or whatever. But we're trying to figure out a way we can get those doors and windows out. We'd like to take the whole wall out, but we found out that the roof would fall down. <laughs> so anyway, we're working on something, but, but to get where and there are seats in here. If you want to be in where the air is better, you're, just come on in. But let me just give you a few thoughts first before, the, before we get to NYJ, all right? In Romans 14, he says there, understand culturally, there were Jews. So if we want to go back pre-cross, pre back here to um, the law of Moses, they gave him some dietary laws. Now, we're not going to talk about the why of it. And I know people who will just die over those dietary laws. It's fine. You can. It calls you weak in there. And it's all right. We're going to be good to you. And, but there are people, that, I mean, there are, there are cultures with different dietary laws. But the Jews had them for, for spiritual reasons, and I believe because they were traveling and all things, there were probably some, some rules about just simple how to stay well. So there were diet rules. No pork. Uh, you, you couldn't eat shrimp. Couldn't eat a catfish. Amen. Well, catfish is kind of nasty anyway. You Southerners that eat catfish, I don't get that. But anyway, um, there's a lot of things you couldn't. Well, when Jesus came along, it says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. But not just for righteousness. The Apostle Paul began preaching all things are clean if they be received with thanksgiving. And that's a wonderful thing. That means bacon with your eggs is okay. That means pork chops with mashed potatoes and thick gravy is A1. Bring the pastor over for lunch as long as the air works. Um, so, so and, and by the way, there are some fussing over this. I mean, right in here, the gospel's being preached, thousands of people being saved in the book of Acts, and they're fighting over, what do you mean, you're a Christian, I mean, you're eating that stuff, and, and they're mad at each other about things, and, and Paul wrote often about diet, trying to square people up on this. Now, the summary was this, look, you that understand, you can eat anything, it's all clean, if you receive with thanksgiving, be patient with these newer Christians who are still locked into the law. My dad uh, was uh, not in ca the Catholic Church all the time. I was, he was in our home, but he grew up in a Catholic Church, around Catholic homes and nuns, and I mean, he just didn't go on occasion. They were, they were full-time Irish Catholic, then down to New Mexico, they were Mexican Catholic, so they were Mexican Irish Catholic. He was Catholic. And when he got saved, you didn't joke about the Catholic Church. That was his heritage. It really was. I mean, he loved them. Those people loved him. 
and they cared about him and and uh, and it was uh, if I remember the story right my mom could tell it better but since I'm preaching I'll just tell it and she can just pretend I'm remembering right but but he's, he didn't he didn't cut up much it was he was saved I mean, he understood salvation going to a good Baptist church but there was still some real closeness back there and then they had an interim type pastor is that when something gonna change remember that calf that uh, Catholic guy that got saved was the interim pastor when you're in Gilroy he was he was brought up Catholic and he was joking about remember the days when and it kind of loosened my dad up a little bit and it kind of broke the ice of you know what there's a lot of nonsense back in those days and and it was almost like the dam burst and now we could just relax and enjoy our our newfound faith but but understand there's some things that were very delicate my grandmother Lutheran all of her life had gotten saved young and but sprinkled like so many by the way there's George Whitfield's probably the greatest preacher pulpiteer in the history since the time of Christ and George Whit Whitfield was a baby baptizer he was a baby sprinkler and it's the most unscriptural thing in the world but these guys were coming out of Catholicism out of the Reformation it's all they knew they've been killing Baptists by the millions trying as best they could to, to subdue biblical Christianity and so you you know you get saved you don't know how many crazy things you believe and so the the Lutheran Church a lot of Presbyterians wonderful saved people many many I'm not saying they all are but over the years a lot of great Presbyterian preachers a lot of the heroes that we hear about Billy Sunday Dwight Moody Charles Finney um, uh, Hudson Taylor those people were Baptists they didn't understand baptism by immersion. They didn't understand it. A lot of them didn't understand eternal security. But you know what? The more you read your Bible, the more you start pushing that baggage of the past away. And, and you, you start grabbing just plain old simple truth. Now, for those of you who are like me, who you had basically not a lot of religion, and you just got a big dose of the King James Bible, it's easy. You that grew up here, you don't know the battles that some people have with those heartstrings tied to their past, to their culture, and to their relatives, and all that kind of thing. And so, uh, here we step into this. Well, back to my grandma. When my grandma got into a Bible preaching church, she realized, I need to get baptized. I never was baptized. I was sprinkled. I was not baptized. Well, she had a friend who was also Lutheran, both ladies in their 60s or whatever. And this lady said, oh, you Gladys, you don't need to be baptized. You know we're just, a, we're saved and whatever. And, you know, she argued with her. It went back and forth, back and forth. And my grandma finally said, if the Bible says it, I need to do it. Amen. Now, my grandma had been saved for, for years and years. And many, many of the Protestants, especially uh, prior to 1970, uh, there was Dr. Hiles used to have joint revivals. He'd, he'd preach for Nazarenes. Most everybody, not everybody, but most of the mainline churches preached the gospel back in the 40s, 50s in that era. They were, there were some differences on eternal security and baptism and, and affiliation things, but they, were, they all agreed on Jesus saved, and you're going to trust Christ and Christ alone. And I'm not saying all, but a lot more of them. Then you get into the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and things started dropping off, and suddenly you got craziness everywhere, and every kind of doctrinal heresy imaginable that came into our world. So these grand, my grandma and this other lady, you know, back in those days, way back there, who trusted Christ, but my grandma was strong enough and had read her Bible and had been around enough. She said, I'm getting baptized. I don't know if this lady ever did get baptized. So she just went to heaven dry clean. It's all right. Uh, she's, she was saved. And, um, and, and, not, and not a, it's, it, it is a big deal. It's a big deal. A lot of, you know, millions of Baptist martyrs died over baptism. But, but, uh, but you know, she may have been doing all she could do. She just... See, he, he defines here in Romans 14, him that is weak in the faith. And I fear that sometimes some of us, and if you weren't in my teacher's meeting, oh, you know what? Uh, I was recording my teacher's meeting, and I still am. Hmm. <laughs> An hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> We're just going to save that hour and 20 minute long recording. I think it's too long to do anything with it. Anyway, I don't know technology. Somebody in this room can figure it out. But if you weren't in our teacher's meeting, we now have a recording you can hear. Plus all the singing, plus the announcements, plus the choir, <laughs> plus the first 10 minutes of my sermon. But, um, but you know, him that is weak in this, so here you are. You get saved, man. You just, you just get a big old dose of Jesus and salvation, and you're in head over heels. And this other person, they get saved. But you know they're just not they're just not quite ready 
for everything. Yes, I want to get saved, but I'm not sure I'm ready to go to that Baptist church where they're crazy people down there. And Paul says, it's okay. That's right. yeah. It's okay. Paul says, I want you to understand. There are you young people going to Bible college. You've been in our church. You've been going soul winning, many of you, since you were seventh grade. Some of you before then. You've been on bus routes for four years, ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. You've been in vacation Bible school and camps. You've memorized hundreds and hundreds of verses. Some of our college students, I've been talking to our college students about college because I'm still in the investigating stages. <laughs> and I've been talking to our college students about school, what's going on, what are they doing? And some of our young people say, Preacher, just about every memory verse they ask us to memorize, we've already memorized. Four years of high school camp, two years of junior high camp, Christian school. Um, you know, one of a, one, some of our young people said they, walk, they were walking out of class and they said, this is Mr. Beal's Baptist history class. They already passed all the tests. <laughs> our young people are well-groomed. But could I say, some of you, you're going into a school with somebody like me who just got saved. That's right. yep. And I, I didn't read my Bible until I was 18. I went to a secular college for a year and a half, started reading my Bible, and they dropped me into a Bible college. I didn't know anything. It was just, it was all new. And I mentioned this at, at youth conference. I remember reading my Bible a couple of hours a day. I did, I, I just fell in love with my Bible. I remember the day I realized Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John knew each other. I figured it out myself. You had to have somebody tell you that. I remember reading my Bible and thinking, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, these guys, they were friends. And I'll tell you that nothing as sweet as learning it yourself. Yeah. But I tell you, it takes a long time that way. <laughs> but, but, you know, so you're, you're my roommate and you're in a Baptist church. I, I, I led, I remember leading, leading a soul. My first, first person I led to Christ was in ceramics class. See, why were you in ceramics class? I was on a basketball scholarship. And so I was in ceramics class. It took me six months to lead that gal to Christ. It just thought that was the fastest I knew how to get it done. And another, the next person I led to Christ, I was going home on a Greyhound bus, and I remember sitting there, it was a 12-hour bus ride. I bet I spent five hours going through the gospel with this guy, another young man, college-age guy. I, I just didn't know how to do it any faster than that. And you're here thinking, man, look at this, this verse, this verse, this verse. Do you believe it? Pray, trust Christ, you're saved. What's the problem? I'm thinking, oh, I can't go that fast. Now I'm a new driver here. I'm barely able to stay in between the dots and the road. And so Paul says to these people there in Romans 14, you that are weak, you that are strong, you that have learned and you've grown, he said, be patient with these people who are weak in the faith. There are some people who it really bothers them. You eat shrimp. Those pork chops, they, they would call that wrong. And you need to be very careful about that. And, and uh, in our intercultural world that we're in here, and some of you are going to be missionaries, you got to be very careful. If my wife and I right now were to go be missionaries to the Middle East, my wife would probably wear a head covering the rest of her life. It's got nothing to do with right and wrong. It has to do with culture. We want to be appropriate. We're not going to, well, we don't have to. Yeah, well, they could chop our heads off too. <laughs> or hers, you know. And then I'd find a girl who wore a head covering. <laughs> but we're, but we're, we've got to understand that we're not all the same in this world. And God is so incredibly patient and so incredibly loving. And so he's talking here primarily about food. But then in verse 5, look down there. One man esteemeth one day above another. There are people who really, really feel these Sabbath things. You cannot violate Sabbath laws. And somebody else, every day is alike. The Apostle Paul didn't care what day was what day. Preach the gospel. Go out. Get the gospel preached. Go to work. Get people saved. Eat what you want to eat. And, and just go. You know, some of you, you're going to go meet people of no clue. I remember coming here. The brother, Ms. Willie, are back here. Here I was. I've been saved just less than seven years. And I had never, I never knew there was an issue over versions of the Bible. I got saved in church that put a King James Bible in my hand. I went to Bible college, and all my classes were, you ha I knew you had to read a King James. You had, if you had outside reading, say you're reading the, the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was a class. They're teaching us the Bible. We had to read it in the King James. I knew that. I didn't know why. Yeah, that's right. 
And I remember being at Brother Woolley's house, and, and he and I were talking a little bit, and they lived in Riverside at the time, and a uh, good visit, and I was getting ready to leave, and I remember him sliding his Bible over and saying, I just need to know, what do you think of that book? And I'm thinking, he has something in mind. And it's not, that's a good one. <laughs> But he'd come from a church where there was a big issue over versions. And I I'd never, I didn't believe wrong, but I didn't believe right either. I just didn't know. And I went studying, and, and I had to figure some things out. And I realized it's a huge issue. But, but Paul's saying here, look at those verses. You, you go to verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. And look at that last phrase in verse 5, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. That is incredible. Yeah. Now he's not talking about salvation here. He's not talking about salvation, how to get to heaven. He's saying, you don't think, you think you ought to go to church on Saturday. I think you ought to go to church on Sunday. And God says, you're right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And you say, well, which one? Both of them. And then God steps back and says, now you know Sunday's the right one. Yeah. But give these people a break. Him that is weak in the, in the faith, he says later, receive ye, but not the doubtful disputations. Don't, don't make it your goal to get in an argument with everybody. There's a guy in heaven now, I'd call his name, but I don't want to hurt his feelings because he's listening. <laughs> but you walk in the back door of this church with a living Bible and he'd shake your hand and between the door and your pew he would explain to you how you had the wrong Bible I'm thinking stop it just, let's just get them saved how about that and then let's let them grow a little bit and let, let's give them a break here come on he wanted you to have the right Bible whether you went to hell or not and I'm thinking I want you to go to heaven then we'll worry about what Bible you read and so what Paul's talking about here is this Verse 4 is where we're going to. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? Now he's not saying give up on truth and don't stand for right. Don't stand against wrong. But he does say don't get busy being so critical about somebody who's serving someone else. Pat McDowell is a servant of God. And it's not my job to judge that man. It's his wife's job. And... Uh, to his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall, look at the end of verse 4, I love this. Yea, he shall be holding up for God is able to make him stand. You know what's great? God is holding up his people. And, and somebody, maybe they struggle a little bit in one area or another. Now, all that to get us to the sermon. And we're going to look at some more verses. If you want to look over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. When someone sins that's near you, you have a decision to make. The decision is, what is your job? If you're in Romans, the next book's 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4. What is your job? When you find 1 Corinthians 4, just hold it and listen. You see, as a leader, as, as a pastor here, if an employee, if I find out Rachel, she's one of our secretaries, she's, she's got a drinking problem. I need to deal with that. But if Josiah has a drinking problem, none of my business. It's not my job. NYJ. Right. Amen. NYJ, not your job. Right. He didn't work for me. You work in a bus? Just became my job. <laughs> um, there are certain relationships where it's my job. I'm the dad. If Josiah... What Josiah drinks, that's my job. I'm his dad. What my mom drinks, NYJ. <laughs> Ain't my job. It's not your job. That makes sense? If you all could catch this, we could go home now, but I don't think you're that quick. We got a lot of NYJ to do before we leave tonight. When I'm the boss, I have employees and they have to do certain things certain ways because it is my job as a boss. But you're working over here and they're working over there. It's not your job to boss your coworker. NYJ, not your job. You're a young person in Bible college 
And here you are in your dormitory room and there are some things that are not appropriate going on. That's your dorm, that is your living area. You are responsible to your college and you don't need to fix it, but you need to go tell somebody who's in charge who will fix it. There's tobacco, there's booze, there's impropriety, there's wrong, moral, whatever, there's dating stuff going on that's wrong. It is your job. But right two doors down at the, uh, you know, off campus, there's somebody doing the exact same thing, NYJ, not your job. Amen. Not your job. Uh, you're sitting over here this evening and, and you're just the average member in our church and some other average member in our church over here. You know, it's none of your business what other people do. That's right. Amen. NYJ, not your job. Write it on your spouse's forehead because you can't see it on your own forehead. Um, not your job, not your job, not your job, not your job. When your spouse sins, they are accountable to God. NYJ. God is the judge, not you. God punishes, not you. God corrects, not you. God condemns, not you. If your husband sins, ladies, you are not God. It's not your area of responsibility. There's a whole lot of this book that tells a lady what her responsibility is as a wife. There's a lot of this book that tells a man what his responsibility is to his husband, to his wife, or his children. There's a lot of Bible that tells us what our responsibility is uh, to our employer or to our employees. But there is no Bible instruction here that's lateral. I work over here in the engine making part of Chevy, and you're over there in the tire assembling part of the Chevy uh, uh, car assembly plant. You know what? It is not my job to tell you how to put tires together. NYJ, not my job. I need to butt out. Someone over there quits doing their job. They're laying down in the job and tires are piling up and rims are piling up and cars are backing up. And I'm over here putting the engine together. Hey, get going, what's wrong with you? NYJ, not your job. Not your job, not your job. There's a boss, it's his job. It's their job. Mike Payne paints buildings, mainly gas stations, right Mike? I pull in, get some gas. I come away with a two-tone car. That's my job. <laughs> we got issues. I am loving it because you're buying me a new paint job. <laughs> but I go by and I'm looking up there. Hey, buddy, you missed a spot. NYJ, I'm not his boss unless I own the gas station or the chain of gas stations. Does this make sense? This is not rocket science tonight. It would sure help my office if we could all catch this simple principle. In 1 Corinthians, look at chapter 4, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who, will both, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall, and look at this phrase, every man have praise of God. Isn't that incredible? When God comes, he's going to make everything clear and God will praise men. Isn't that incredible? Amen. You know why? Because he sees this lady who struggled in a difficult marriage trying to raise her children and trying to do right for him. And there's been some battles along the way. And I believe God's going to say, Lady, you're awesome. You did a good job. You know, God loves you. And God gives you a certain amount of grace. He'll see the guy struggling to pay the bills and and his income was not quite as much as he'd hoped it would be. And there's some battles in keeping finance together. And the husband and wife worked together. And, and they kept their family afloat and raised some good kids for God. And, and uh, I believe every man will have praise of God to what they've done, how they've handled it. That, that uh, handicapped child, that spouse who has a stroke or has some difficulties and suddenly cannot work anymore. Look over to the book of James with me, way back in the back of your Bible, the book of James chapter 4. You see, God, when he comes, he's going to make everything clear. I look at that teenager and that doesn't go to our church. I mean, doesn't go to our school. Maybe they go to our church. And I look at that teenager and uh, I see him at the mall smoking a cigarette, NYJ. That's right. 
NYJ, not my job. You think teenagers ought to be smoking cigarettes? Not my job. It's against the law. They should be at least 18 to smoke cigarettes. I'm not a cop. That's right. I'm their pastor. Amen. I'm going to go talk to them, tell them how good it is to see them. I'm going to be their friend. I'm going to let them know I love them. Say, you love somebody who smokes cigarettes? Yeah, there's several here tonight. Yep. Amen. Yep. How do you know? They think breath mints cover. But get it <laughs> NYJ, man, it's not my job. It's not your job. We were, you know, we were up fishing, and somebody said, you know, they caught more fish than their limit. <laughs> NYJ. Unless you, got a, unless you got a game warden sticker, NYJ, man. <clears throat> They're making up for your sorry ability to catch fish. <laughs> You know, these vigilantes who want to go around to try and make the world a better place, they could if they just go jump in a lake. <laughs> in, in James chapter 4, look there would be a James chapter 4. Look at verse 11. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. This is, what, a wonder, what a wonderful statement. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Do you understand? You can become a self-appointed deity. You could come along and say, you know what? I am no longer a person busy obeying the Bible. I am the judge. That's what God does. And I am here to inspect everybody else's life. Just so you know, you're not God. I'm not God. People worry, wonder what pastors think. Please at home, don't ever say what would pastor think. The only thing you should say about that is when you're making cookies. I would think, I love you, you're my friends, you've put up with me in all kinds of weakness, and I'm more than happy to be your friend with your weaknesses. That's what we are. We're brought by the blood of the Lamb. You young people have grown up here and you're wrestling with establishing yourself. Maybe you're going to get married or you're recently married and you're starting to raise some kids. You know what? I love you and I'm so thankful for you and that you're here and you've got a God in heaven. But in James 4.11, speak not evil one of another, brethren. Quit your criticism and your gossip. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law. You are criticizing the word of God and judging the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. And you can try to become a judge, or you can try to be the one who knows everything, and you can just say, God, I'll, you do your job and I'll do my job. Let me give you quick statements. First of all, your job is to forgive people. We know that, right? Be kind one to another, tenderhearted forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you and so here I have this person that's offended me it could be a neighbor a friend a wife a parent a child you know what my job is love them that's, right. Amen. that's the second greatest commandment in the whole Bible to love my neighbor as myself I am not to judge my wife I am not to judge my parent I'm not to judge now as a parent I am under responsibility biblically to train up a child in the way he should go. I've got biblical things I've got to do. That is my job. God outlines my job very clearly. You that are, you, you're going to go to college, Sonia, and there's a guy or a girl you like. Not your job to tell them how to drive. Amen. You're working too many hours. NYJ. Or you could just put shut up. <laughs> that guy, you, you girls. You girls are, just so you know, you girls are way more mature than a guy. You know what a guy's concerned about? Food. And somehow finding a way to be able to kiss the bride. John Abbey's, right John? John knows. John's 100 years old and that's still all he's really interested in. <laughs> Kissing the bride and eating, the, eating whatever Korean food Mrs. Abbey makes for him. And, uh, and you're the girl. Now you know what a girl's concerned about? The future, stability, you know, a car, a home, a ministry, money in the bank. And uh, he's out there. He spends $35 a day at fast food places. I asked one of our college guys, 
I shouldn't have done it in front of a bunch of people. I didn't even think it was a terrible thing to do, but I did it in front of a group. And I said, how much money do you spend on your own? You know, just in between and to and from work, whatever. This guy spent 200 bucks that month on, on food. Just, I mean, he eats in the dorms. I said, what? And I thought, oh, I should be talking about this in front of everybody. Not my job, not my job, not my job, not my job. <laughs> I'm just thinking we got freshmen going off to college. How much money should they plan on needing? Freshmen, you don't need 50 bucks a week to eat on. Unless that's all your food and your mother's food. <laughs> and the girlfriend says, you know, you're spending way too much money on food. NYJ. That's right. Amen. Not your job. You're not his mother. You're not his father. You're not his God. Just decide whether you want to marry a guy who's going to eat everything you serve at home and spend $200 a month, which is a car payment for an inexpensive car, at McDonald's. That's a lot of bad food. Number one, your job is to forgive. Number two, your job is to love your neighbor. The one with the loud dog. <laughs> now we've stepped over. No, no one agrees with it now, right? <laughs> the one who plays the loud music till one in the morning? Yeah, love your neighbor. Okay, that's it. We just marked that off my outline there. <laughs> Not your job to tell me what to preach. <laughs> number three, we'll skip right over number two, okay? Your job is specific. Your job is very specific. As a wife, you're to honor your husband, to respect your husband, to reverence your husband. Those are biblical words. As a husband, you are to love. You are to dwell with her according to knowledge. You are to give yourself for your wife. There are things that are simple rules. Our job is a very specific job. God is very specific in what he wants to do. As a child, you're to honor your mother and father, obey your mother and father. As believers, we're to love our neighbor, we're to forgive, we're to be patient, we're to have long suffering. Our, duty, our duties are very specific. It's not our job to tell people how to do what they do. You go to our, our website or Facebook page or church, somewhere there's a comment. Is it normal for people to knock on doors at 8 o'clock at night? I mean, that's pretty late, don't you think? I mean, I wouldn't go to this church just because of that. And just the other day, I led a lady to the Lord at 8 o'clock at night. Because I'm watching, I don't knock on doors myself after 8 o'clock. A lot of people do. I don't think it's wrong. But I try to make 8 o'clock my shutoff time, and I'm watching. And it was 7.58. We had two doors left. And I said, quick, take those two doors. And, uh, and that's not, and at 8 o'clock, that's my, my time. It's not a right or wrong. I met Carl Hammonds about 8.15. Carl pastored for many years, started our Christian school. So I'm all for making it 8.15. Um, my job, this is now we'll get to the meat of the message. My job does not change when you fail at your job. My job does not change when you fail at your job. Let me just talk about me first. As a pastor, on this side of the platform, I have a, a whole Bible full of things a pastor is supposed to do and to be. You have a whole Bible full of things you are supposed to do and be as Christians. But when you fail, it has no bearing on what I'm supposed to do. I am still supposed to do what I'm supposed to do. Amen. That's right. I alluded to this some this morning in my sermon about fathers. My children have a responsibility, and I have a responsibility as a father. But my responsibility as a father does not change if my children fail at their responsibility. You're a wife, and you have a responsibility. And if your husband fails at his responsibility, do you know, ladies, you are still supposed to love your husband? Love phileo. That's the warm, fuzzy, affectionate word. When he fails at his job. Now we're really going to meddle. When your spouse fails and you don't talk to them, your sin is worse than their sin. Because you're over here doing right and then they do wrong. And now you decide it's your job to judge them, to be judge, jury, and executioner. Pass the salt. How's your day? Fine. 
bedtime. And James 4.11 says, you just became a judge of the law instead of a doer of the law because you know what? What they do has no effect on what God commanded you to do. That's right. Amen. This has gone from preaching to meddling. I know a church, some of the members didn't like the direction the church was going as a new pastor and the church was getting more fundamental and straighter and soul winning, people getting saved, baptized, the church was growing, and they just liked the old, they didn't want all these new people messing up their church. So they started holding back their tithe. Now, church member's job is to tithe. Period. Like the church or not, tithe. If the church is the right church, go to the right church. Tithe to the right church. Don't, you don't tithe to an evangelist. You don't tithe to a TV show. You don't tithe to a missionary. You tithe to your church. That's your job, to tithe the church. Say, well, I'm not real happy with the direction the church is going. Vote the pastor out. We live in a democratic society, and our Baptist churches are historically a democratic sort of an organization. And you've got every right in our church, according to our church constitution, you want to get rid of me, vote me out. But you don't have a right to keep your tithe. That's a sin. Because no matter what somebody else does, you're still supposed to do what you're supposed to do. See, not your job. It's not your job to fill in the blank. Your wife's pregnant in 115 degree June, July. We have several ladies. I think we have four ladies expecting here. And um, you think, man, why don't we just go out for a walk? She says, why don't you just go soak your head? <laughs> Come on, I'm the head of the house. Let's go. She says, you're an idiot head of the house. <laughs> why don't you go get some ice pads for my back? It's not, not my job to tell my wife what to do. I, I know two or three, I know at least two men who quit going to our church simply because I said, it's not your job to order your wife around. My job is to rule my house, not to boss. I'm not the slave driver. Not just me. In all my 35 years of marriage, probably once or twice I've ever insisted on anything in our home. We're a team. We're one flesh. It's not my job to tell my wife what to do, nor hers to tell me. Over in Romans 14, we read, um, look back there to Romans 14. We didn't get this far. Look back to Romans 14. We'll be done. Not your job. If you want to, you're looking for Romans 14, but ladies, Titus chapter 2 says the older ladies will teach the younger ladies to love their husband. That's that, that's that, it's not the word agape, husbands love your wives. That's agape, that's an unconditional divine love. Wives are to love phileo their husband, that's a, an affectionate love. That's like chocolate ice cream love. That's like brownies and root beer love. You say, why do the women get the agape divine love and men the casual carnal love? That's a stupid question. <laughs> You're obviously single. <laughs> Romans 14, look down at verse 10. Romans 14, 10. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it nigh thy brother? We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And see, he says, hold it, we're going to keep reading. He says, don't judge your brother. Don't, don't push him away. Your wife's been a bag. Your wife's been nagging. She's been a gripe and complaining. Your job, man, is to love your wife. Kids, your parents, you're a little hard to get along with and bossy and overbearing. And, 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 uh, and they don't understand how wise and prudent you are. You get the same job to honor your mother and father. That's your job. Your job is to honor them. Do you know, if the President of the United States walked in here tonight, I would treat him with all the dignity and respect I possibly could muster. Because he's my President. That's right. Personally, I think he's the lowest form of life ever lived in the White House. Yeah. Amen. But he is our President. Right. And I love our military. You know, the, the, they treat him... <laughs> I don't know how you can salute that guy as commander-in-chief. Thank God for the character of our military. You heard when the Clintons were in office, President Bill Clinton walked up with a pig under both arms. And he's walking up, one of the Marines saluted him and said, uh, nice pig, sir. He said, I got him for Chelsea and Hillary. And the Marines said, good trade.
That's terrible. But anyway, I won't even say what went on lately. <laughs> look, at, look at verse 11. Let's, let's go verse 10 again. But why art thou, why didst thou judge thy brother? Why is, dost thou set it nigh thy brother? We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. Look down to verse 12. So then every one of us shall give account of who? himself to God. My wife will give an account of herself to God for the commands and the principles God asked her to keep. And I will give an account of myself before God for the things God asks of me. And each one of us will do that. I am accountable to my God. I'm accountable to my parents have certain responsibilities, things I should be and do as a child. There are things I need to do to my employer or toward my employer. There are, uh, there's responsibilities I have toward my government, my, the police and the governors and those people God put in authority was I have a responsibility to an appropriate relationship to those people. Amen. But in your, in your job to boss those people. And we can vote them out, we can vote them in. It's all, we, can, we live in a great country, don't we? You can write nasty letters. And I remember writing an email when, I think Schwarzenegger was in office, whoever was in office when they voted in the gay marriage thing, and a week later or two days later, there were a thousand lightning fires Amen. in the northern half of the state of California. Right. And I just wrote a note, said, you vote this in and there's a thousand lightning strikes. Guess what's coming next? And right when I hit the send button, I thought, oh, am I threatening the governor? <laughs> is this, you know, is the FBI going to come to my door? Oh, pull it back. <laughs> you know, he's not going to read that, but I felt that way. And, but you know what? The governor's going to stand before God. Our president will stand before God. Lastly, my job, and this is the hardest, my job does not change when God does something that hurts me. My job does not change when God does something I do not like. My business fails, a child dies, the wrong person gets in the White House, which I think it's gonna happen. You say, which one? Either. You want to know the fulfillment of the lesser of two evils? We are living that today, man. We are just living that. Someone at church was mean to you. You felt neglected. So you walk into church and you don't look at them. I think you're supposed to love your neighbor. That's your job. Your job is not to be unkind to the person who's unkind to you. It's not your job. If we could just figure out what our job is, we'd be a lot happier people. We could say, mind your own business, M-Y-O-B. I don't know, not your job's better. Let's keep our job straight. Let's pray. Father, bless us today. and Maybe be careful at home careful at work, careful in the community. I'm not the one to boss around the employees at the grocery store. I'm not the one to correct the kid down the street. And I pray you'd help us, Lord, to carefully identify our duties, our biblical responsibilities. We sat this week, the last few days, with three guest preachers in our pulpit. And for a few days, they were here on our turf, and it really was their job to handle things like we would want. But today, they're in their own pulpits, and in my business, what they do or what they say. And so our jobs are changed from hour to hour. Bless these who are going to be busy at work in the morning early and on the road. May they be careful to know what their responsibilities are. May we be careful at home and then careful at church. Every hour, it seems, sometimes those things can change. May we remember what is and is not our job. Help especially our college students as they uh, have some summertime. They are still in their parents' home. And it is their parents' job to oversee their house. And then when they're at school, may they realign their job. Help us, Lord. Very awkward and delicate things. We need your spirit's help, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together just for a moment. Take a moment alone with God. If he spoke to your heart about some things, ask for wisdom to apply it.
this morning, if there's some area you need a little adjustment, maybe you just need wisdom. You may be entering into a situation where you're not quite sure what your job is. Go to God. You have a wonderful Father. I just don't want to do things that aren't my job. I don't want to hurt people. If you're not sure that you're saved and going to heaven, would you give us the honor of showing you out of a Bible how to be saved? You might have been coming here a long time and you've been wrestling with this thing and you, you just, in your heart, you realize, I'm not saved. I've never really trusted Christ. Would you look, come forward, let us show you out of a Bible how to be saved? If you've been saved and never baptized this evening, it'd be a good time to do that. Not your job. Maybe NY, in in MJ, not my job. Brothers and sisters, rarely is it your job to boss your siblings. Maybe your parents leave you in that place, but parents, I'd recommend children not boss each other. That's just my opinion. I think you cross some boundaries that are very delicate.